one of the paradoxes of Trump was that he was less inclined to be interventionist on the global st stage than, say, um, Hillary Clinton, right, or or George W. Bush, and that there was a kind of a weird destabilizing maverick quality to his image and to his decision making that meant he was unpredictable. Tell them you love me is the name of the show. Um, it's set in America, um, at the cast are mostly American. And I wanted to just talk to you briefly, Louis, about, about where America is at the moment. You know, you, you've explored so many avenues in your career, and many of those are in the States. Your Forbidden America series was brilliant. You spoke to, amongst other people, you know, young, often deplatformed members of the far right, all using the internet to push their message. And I look ahead to the US election this year and the polls so strongly leaning to Donald Trump. And I wonder what you imagine might happen to some of those subcultures, some of these kind of fringes characters, I suppose, characters on the fringe or who might feel that they don't have any, you know, don't have any connection to sort of normal life. That doesn't sound quite right. They don't, they don't have any connection to mainstream life about what Donald Trump in power in America again might do for those people. Um, I, you know, it's a big question. I do think there's a high likelihood Donald Trump will win the next election. I think it's probably what will happen, actually. And but I also think that it would be a mistake to sort of see his constituency as a sort of a fringe. Like he, you know, you he he enjoys something like I don't know, forty percent of the support of of the electorate and. Um, that that's that's a lot of people. That's all people who would see themselves as just all American mainstream, um, regular regular people, the Joes, Joes and Janes, yeah. and and the majority so, of regular people are now intending at this time to vote Donald Trump. And I wonder, I wonder where that leaves us, but also where it leaves those people who are who are disaffected, who might feel either disillusioned that they've got what they want or feel empowered by it. If he wins, do you mean? Yeah. Uh, well, any, anything's possible. I do think that um, the, the Trump brand and the Trump narrative is so strong. And the idea that, you know, you know, wherever it may come from, the idea that he is a sort of lone crusader, the only one willing to take on the, a corrupt establishment, which is, you know, the, that, that sort of the, the myth that, he's just, that he has created for himself. Um, I do think there's, a, there's a, you know, even once he's in office, I think that there's so much confirmation bias that people, whatever happens, people will see him as speaking for them. And I think actually he would have been re-elected in, um, in 2020 if it hadn't been for the coronavirus, right? I don't think there's much question about that, that um, it, was the, it was sort of the mass panic and the sort of the sense of dislocation that followed from the virus that meant that Biden got elected. So, yeah, I mean, his approval ratings when he was in office were relatively high. I think there's bigger issues, though, which are to do with how how the, how the Internet and the tech barons take on disinformation online and the extent to which um, we're able to um, get a hold of algorithm driven um, fake news and, 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 and try and curate a sort of conversational space that um is less toxic and less tribal and less nativist mm. do we do we fail to get a handle on that under donald trump is he going to help or help or hinder the power of misinformation the different things uh, you know i'm very out. like it's, it, it it's very easy to sort of bang the drum for uh a kind of more patrician almost neoliberal um, establishment and say so oh, Trump's going to inflame nativism not to say that that's not true but I don't really I don't want to buy into that uncritically I mean one of the paradoxes of Trump was that he was less inclined to be interventionist on the global st stage than say um, Hillary Clinton right or or George W Bush and that there was a kind of a weird destabilizing maverick quality to his image and to his decision making that meant he was unpredictable right he did he did very little in the way of aggressive foreign policy interventions 
So, you know, I think it, he, he, he comes at so many different angles and he contradicts himself so much. I don't think it's out of the question that he would rein in um, certain tech platforms. I mean, I might be wrong, but I just think his main brand is that he's unpredictable, right? That seems to be what he specializes in mm. is kind of shooting in every direction, right? And he's, he's pro-China, he's anti-China, he's pro-Putin, he's anti-Putin. So I, I have no clue really what his steer would be regarding um, whatever you call it, like sort of viral disinformation um, once, you know, what he's going to do about that once he's in Regulating office. Regulating the internet, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, let's finish up by returning to one of the characters in the documentary. She's called Deva Kaznic, and she's an anthropologist with a muscular disease. Um, she also worked with Anna. And in the documentary, she talks about the gift of speech. Of course, you know, she doesn't have fluid speech, but she says that when you don't have it, don't have the gift of speech, people abuse it. She said, it takes me so long to get my words out. I'd better damn well sure, damn well make sure I have something good to say. And I thought that that was incredible and pertinent, of course, uh, for people who use their voice and their speech a lot in their jobs, which includes you. And I wonder how the power of your words, how you use your words, how you conduct yourself, how that's changed over your now three decades interviewing people, making documentaries, making TV programmes? Well, I, I feel lucky in a way that I, I came to journalism and TV and documentary making hesitantly, and a sense of hesitancy has always informed, um, has always informed my journalism. Uh, I will say that when I look back at my old programmes, as I want to do, they're on iPlayer. I'm giving a shout out to BBC <laughs> iPlayer. And the fact that there's a BBC iPlayer channel that just plays my programmes on a loop, believe it or not. How's that uh, for you? <laughs> yeah, amazing. I mean, it's a strange, you know, you just any time of the night or day, you can click on it, you'll be halfway through something or other. It might, And so sometimes it's like playing Louis through roulette. You know, you never know what you're going to get. But what's like strange me about it, of an identity yeah, like, crisis, sort of like you, you get hit by a bullet of nostalgia and sometimes well a feeling that there are they are pretty good they're really good programs like i stand by all my old shows but when i am caught by something it's to do with how the voiceover or commentary is written the bit where i go i wasn't sure what i thought about bob i wondered if and sometimes it's where you there's a temptation to get in an easy shot. So, so that's, those are the parts I think, well, was that a bit glib? Could I have written that slightly better? Um, does it sound cheeky or overly judgmental? And I think, you know, to your point about weighing your words and having something worthwhile to say, I've been lucky that yes, I was sort of fairly nuanced. I haven't always got it exactly right. As I get older and more confident in documentary making paradoxically, there's more of a temptation some, sometimes to pontificate, which is slightly what I've been doing in this interview. I do try and check myself. I don't post much on social media beyond saying if I have a program out or sometimes recipes for vegetarian lasagna. Yeah. Um, so I don't eyebrows. feel like I, don't, I try not to be one of those people who's always kind of chucking red meat at their base saying like, wow, look at this person. Aren't they awful? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I do just basically make let the journalism or the work speak for itself and um and you know hope hopefully i try not to have too many opinions is the bottom line yeah and that's hard sometimes are your are your question questions more or less risky do you think now do you think the sort of gift of age and experience has made you more hesitant or or has I that think, made you want no, to take I think on? um well i've been i've got a, i've got a podcast on spotify and what I notice is that um, I think I'm getting a little better at being myself, which is double edged because more of me, if you don't like me, is worse. But if if you feel like if I, I feel as though because I've seen a bit more of the world, I've got three children, I've been married, for, you know, a number of years, um, I'm 53 years old. I, I guess I feel more confident of asking questions that um take you to a darker or deeper place right without it feeling like i'm trying to slip one past someone like uh I, the I truth is, think, most of the time people are trying to connect and i think a lot of the time people enjoy being challenged or having um whatever the elephant in the room is having it brought into the conversation and so I, i'd like to think i'm getting slightly 
better at doing it and doing it from a place of sort of compassion and maturity. But um, I'm probably, you know, that's a bit like marking your own homework. It's for mm. others to judge. What do you mean by you haven't been yourself over a uh, period well, of time? Well, I just want to say I've more myself. All I mean is uh, I've, I've allowed more of my own personality to poke through. I mean, partly that's a result of the form, which is podcasting or I've written a couple of books now. And in the old days, I thought I had to maintain a sort of mysterious um, sort of enigmatic presence in, in the programs and not say too much about myself. Um, whereas now, I, I suppose I'm not too fussy about it. Like I can just say, here's what's on my mind. Here's the things mm -hmm. I'm grappling with. Um, how does that sit with you? You've turned into a sharer, Louis. I mean, maybe an oversharer. <laughs> but, you know, so be it. I, I, I've got nothing to hide. You know, I used to think I was like a maybe a bit of a prankster and a provocateur, but, you know, a bit like Ali G or Chris Morris. And now I think, um, not really. I'm, I'm fine just being a, a, a journalist who is sort of trying to connect with people and tell the truth about what he sees. Louis Through, thank you so much for speaking to us. Tell Them You Love Me is coming to Sky Documentaries and the streaming service now on Saturday, the 3rd of February. It's been a great pleasure speaking to you. Thank you.